So we're going to review chapters 12 and 13. We'll read 14 and 15 today, talk about that for a bit, and then we'll look at that homework. So let's look at 12 and 13. <clears throat> All right. So the main idea of chapter 12 was they were having a meeting to describe words that uh, um, would describe Wilbur. And Templeton was missing. All right. So to do this, what I'm going to do is this and click on this. All right. So let's take a look at this. The first thing that happened was Charlotte called all the animals to the barn, right? And everyone was there except Templeton. Templeton arrived late for the meeting. And at first he refused to help Charlotte. But then the sheep told him he'd starve. So Templeton finally agreed. All right. And Zuckerman's reacted. They were thrilled, right? They were like, oh my gosh, get the reporter out here. He needs a camera guy. Like, let's get this out. We are so excited, so thrilled. And Lurvie doesn't like Wilbur because he has too much work to do now. It makes much more work for him to have to do. So we have some people who are loving Wilbur and some people who are kind of starting to go like, this is too much attention for a pig. Like, uh, I miss the way things were. So let's read chapter 14 and 15. Go ahead and get your book and find page 105. Chapter 14, Dr. Dorian. The next day was Saturday. Fern stood at the kitchen sink drying her, the breakfast dishes as her mother washed them. Mrs. Arabelle worked silently. She hoped Fern would go out and play with the other children instead of heading for the Zuckerman's barn to sit and watch animals. Charlotte's the best storyteller I ever heard, said Fern, poking her dish towel into a cereal bowl. Fern, said her mother sternly, you must not invent things. You know spiders don't tell stories. Spiders can't talk. Charlotte can, replied Fern. She doesn't talk very loud, but she talks. What kind of story did she tell? asked Mrs. Arabel. Well, began Fern, she told us about a cousin of hers who caught a fish in her web. Don't you think that's fascinating? Fern, dear, how would a fish get in a spider's web? said Mrs. Arabel. You know it couldn't happen. You're making this up. Uh, oh, it happened all right, replied Fern. Charlotte never fibs. The cousin of hers built a web across a stream. One day she was hanging around on the web and a tiny fish leaped into the air and got tangled in the web. The fish was caught by one fin. Mother, its tail. It was wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. You can't, can't you just see the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish? Charlotte's cousin kept slipping in, dodging out, but she was beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing. Fern, snapped her mother. Stop it. Stop inventing these wild tales. I'm not inventing, said Fern. I'm just telling you the facts. What finally happened, asked her mother, whose curiosity began to get the better of her. Charlotte's cousin won. She wrapped the fish up. Then she ate him when she got good and ready. Spiders have to eat, the same as the rest of us. Yes, I suppose they do, said Mrs. Arable vaguely. Charlotte has another cousin who is a balloonist. She stands on her head, lets out a lot of line, and is carried afloat on the wind. Mother, wouldn't you simply love to do that? Yes, I would, come to think of it, replied Mrs. Arable. But Fern, darling, I wish you could play outdoors today instead of going to Uncle Homer's barn. Find some of your playmates and do something nice outdoors. You're spending so much time, too much time in that barn. It isn't good for you to be alone so much. Alone, said Fern. Alone? My best friends are in the barn cellar. It's a very sociable place. Not at all lonely. Fern disappeared after a while, walking down the road toward Zuckerman's. Her mother dusted the sitting room. As she worked, she kept thinking about Fern. It didn't seem natural for a little girl to be so interested in animals. Finally, Mr. Mrs. Arable made up her mind that she would pay a call on old Dr. Dorian and ask his advice. She got in the car and drove to his office in the village. Dr. Dorian had a thick beard. He was glad to see Mrs. Arable and gave her a comfortable chair. It's about Fern, she explained. Fern spends entirely too much time in the Zuckerman's barn. It doesn't seem normal. She sits on a milk stool in a corner of the barn cellar near the pig pen and watches animals hour after hour. 
She just sits and listens. Dr. Dorian leaned back and closed his eyes. How enchanting, he said. It must be real nice and quiet down there. Homer has some sheep, hasn't he? Yes, said Mrs. Arabel. But it all started with that pig we let Fern raise on a bottle. She calls him Wilbur. Homer bought the pig, and ever since it left our place, Fern has been going to her uncle's to be near it. I've been hearing things about that pig, said Dr. Dorian, opening his eyes. They say he's quite a pig. Have you heard about the words that appeared in the spider's web? asked Mrs. Arabel nervously. Yes, replied the doctor. Well, do you understand it? asked Mrs. Arabel. Understand what? Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Oh, no, said Dr. Dorian. I don't understand it. But, for that matter, I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said they were a miracle. But nobody pointed out that the web itself is a miracle. What's miraculous about a spider's web? said Mrs. Arabel. I don't see why you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. Ever tried to spin one? asked Dr. Dorian. Mrs. Arabel shifted uneasily in her chair. No, she replied, but I can crochet a doily, and I can knit a sock. Sure, said the doctor, but somebody taught you, didn't they? My mother taught me. Well, who taught a spider? A young spider knows how to spin a web without any instruction from anybody. Don't you regard that as a miracle? I suppose so, said Mrs. Arabel. I never looked at it that way before. Still, I don't understand how those words got into the web. I don't understand it, and I don't like what I can't understand. None of us do, said Dr. Dorian, sighing. I am a doctor. Doctors are supposed to understand everything, but I don't understand everything, and I don't intend to let it worry me. Mrs. Arabel fidgeted. Fern says the animals talk to each other. Dr. Dorian, do you believe animals talk? I've never heard one say anything, he replied, but that proves nothing. It's quite possible that an animal has spoken civilly to me and that I didn't catch the remark because I wasn't paying attention. Children pay better attention than grown-ups. If Fern says that the animals in Zuckerman's barn talk, I'm quite ready to believe her. Perhaps if people talk less, animals would talk more. People are incessant talkers. I can give you my word on that. Well, I feel better about Fern, said Mrs. Arabel. You don't think I need to worry about her? Does she look well? asked the doctor. Oh, yes. Appetite good? Oh, yes. She's always hungry. Sleep well at night? Oh, yes. Then don't worry, said the doctor. Do you think she'll ever start thinking about something besides pigs and sheep and geese and spiders? How old is Fern? She's eight. Well, said Dr. Dorian, I think she'll always love animals, but I doubt that she spends her entire life in Homer Zuckerman's barn cellar. How about boys? Does she know any boys? She knows Henry Fussy, said Mrs. Arabel brightly. Dr. Dorian closed his eyes again and went into deep thought. Henry Fussy, he mumbled. Hmm. Remarkable. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Let Fern associate with her friends in the barn if she wants to. I would say, offhand, that spiders and pigs are fully as interesting as Henry Fussy. Yet, I predict that the day will come when even Henry will drop some chance remark that catches Fern's attention. It's amazing how children change from year to year. How's Avery? he asked, opening his eyes wide. Oh, Avery, chuckled Mrs. Arable. Avery is always fine. Of course, he gets into poison ivy and gets stunned by wasps and bees and brings frogs and snakes home and breaks everything he lays his hands on. He's fine. Good, said the doctor. Mrs. Arabel said goodbye and thanked Dr. Dorian very much for his advice. She felt greatly relieved. Chapter 15. The Crickets. The crickets sang in the grasses. They sang the song of summer's ending, a sad, monotonous song. Summer's over and gone. They sang, summer over and gone, over and gone. Summer is dying, dying. The crickets felt it was their duty to warn everybody that summertime cannot last forever. Even on the most beautiful days in the whole year, the days when summer is changing into fall, the crickets spread the rumor of sadness and change. Everybody heard the sound of the crickets. Avery and Fern Arabelle heard it as they walked the dusty road. They knew that school would soon begin again. The young geese heard it and knew they would never be little goslings again. Charlotte heard it and knew that she hadn't much time left. 
Mrs. Zuckerman, at work in the kitchen, heard the crickets, and a sadness came over her, too. Another summer gone, she sighed. Lurvy, at work building a crate for Wilbur, heard the song and knew it was time to dig potatoes. Summer's over and gone, repeated the crickets. How many nights till frost, sang the crickets. Goodbye, summer, goodbye, goodbye. The sheep heard the crickets, and they felt so uneasy. They broke a hole in the pasture fence and wandered up into the field across the road. The gander discovered the hole and let his whole family through, and they walked it to the orchard and ate the apples that were lying on the ground. A little maple tree in the swamp heard the crickets on and turned bright red with anxiety. Wilbur was now the center of attraction on the farm. Good food and regular hours were showing results. Wilbur was a pig any man would be proud of. One day, more than a hundred people came to stand at his yard and admire him. Charlotte had written the words, Radiant, and Wilbur really looked radiant as he stood in the golden sunlight. Ever since the spider had befriended him, he had done his best to live up to his reputation. When Charlotte's web said, Some pig, Wilbur had tried hard to look like some pig. When Charlotte's web said, Terrific, Wilbur had tried hard to look terrific. And now that the web said, Radiant, he did everything possible to make himself glow. It's not easy to look radiant, but Wilbur threw himself into it with a will. He would turn his head slightly and blink his long eyelashes. Then he would breathe deeply, and when his audience grew bored, he would sprint into the air and do a backflip with a half twist. At this, the crowd would yell and cheer. How's that for a pig? Mr. Zuckerman would ask, well pleased with himself. That pig is radiant. Some of Wilbur's friends in the barn worried for fear all this attention would go to his head and make him stuck up. But it never did. Wilbur was modest. Fame did not spoil him. He still worried some about the future, and he could hardly believe that a mere spider would be able to save his life. Sometimes at night, he would have a bad dream. He would dream that men were coming to get him with knives and guns, but that was only a dream. In the daytime, Wilbur usually felt happy and confident. No pig ever had truer friends, and he realized that friendship is one of the most satisfying things in the world. Even the song of the crickets did not make Wilbur too sad. He knew it was almost time for the county fair, and he was looking forward to the trip. If he could distinguish himself at the fair and maybe win some prize money, he was sure Zuckerman would let him live. Charlotte had worries of her own. She kept quiet about them. One morning, Wilbur asked her about the fair. You're going with me, aren't you, Charlotte? He said. Well, I don't know, replied Charlotte. The fair comes at a bad time for me. I shall find it inconvenient to leave home, even for a few days. Why? asked Wilbur. Oh, I just don't feel like leaving my web. Too much going on around here. Please come with me, begged Wilbur. I need you, Charlotte. I can't stand going to the fair without you. You've just got to come. No, said Charlotte. I believe I'd better stay home and see if I can get some work done. What kind of work? asked Wilbur. Egg laying. It's time I made an egg sack and filled it with eggs. I didn't know you could lay eggs, said Wilbur in amazement. Oh, sure, said the spider. I'm versatile. What does versatile mean? Full of eggs? asked Wilbur. Certainly not, said Charlotte. Versatile means I can turn with ease from one thing to another. It means I don't have to limit my activities to spinning and trapping and stunts like that. Why don't you come with me to the fairgrounds and lay your eggs there, pleaded Wilbur. It will be wonderful fun. Charlotte gave her web a twitch and moodily watched it sway. I'm afraid not, she said. You don't know the first thing about laying eggs, Wilbur. I can't arrange my family duties to suit the management of the county fair. When I get ready to lay eggs, I have to lay eggs, fair or no fair. However, I don't want you to worry about it. You might lose weight. We'll leave it this way. I'll come to the fair if I possibly can. Oh, good, said Wilbur. I knew you wouldn't forsake me just when I need you most. All that day, Wilbur stayed inside, taking life easy in the straw. Charlotte rested and ate a grasshopper. She knew she couldn't help Wilbur much longer. In a few days, she would have to drop everything and build the beautiful little sack that would hold her eggs.
So let's think about those two chapters that we just read. So we met a new character, Dr. Dorian. Why did Mrs. Arabel want to go see Dr. Dorian? She was so worried about Fern, right? She was like, she's talking to animals. She's saying they talk. I don't know what's going on. And Dr. Dorian's like, she's probably okay. Like, uh, maybe they do talk. Maybe they don't. We don't really know. But is it really hurting her? No, it's not. And then in chapter 15, we learn a lot about Charlotte, don't we, in that short, short chapter. Look on page 115. And Charlotte says uh, she had her own worries. She has her own worries. What do you think those worries are? About her eggs, right? She's worried if she ha like makes her sack at the fair, she won't be able to come back, right? And she had to raise her family there then. She's going to get worried about those eggs. In chapter 15, there's a conflict. What do you think the conflict was? What's kind of that problem? When things don't match up as a conflict. Yeah, Wilbur's like, come to this area with me. And Charlotte's like, I don't think I can because I gotta lay my eggs. And Wilbur's like, hmm, right? So we'll have to see if uh, Charlotte can go to the fair. And last question. If you were Charlotte, how would you feel right now? What would you do? It's a hard question, isn't it? And I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. Because you might feel bad for Wilbur, right? Like, oh, I really want to go. But you might be like, I got to take care of myself too. I don't know. It depends on your personality. Which one would you do? All right. For homework today, chapter 14 and 15, match the end of the sentence to the correct line. So I don't have a beginning part of the sentence, and then you finish it with the ones up top. But they're actual sentences from the book, so if you need to look through and find them, go ahead and do that. And chapter 15, true or false going on in there. Let me know if you have any questions. Otherwise, thanks for joining and good luck on your homework.